three years, almost. Almost three. Um, yeah, I interviewed him when he first came on board and I've been working with him ever since. It's been awesome. So, um, what I'm talking about tonight is the DLM.com versioning system. Um, it is <coughs> the system that we use to host, or to um, serve as the back end for all the configurations for all the websites that we host. And I'll get into a lot of details about the architecture. Uh, please ask any questions you have throughout. Don't hold them, just shout them out. Have to take whatever, you know, whatever grants we may come to. So DLO.com, uh, founded in 1998 in Burlington, Vermont, by a group of six people, I believe one of whom was a used car dealer. And basically the guys were trying to build a platform for you know, this one dealership, and then they were, well, what was the platform? They were building a site for one dealership. They realized that they actually had the ability to provide a platform and to actually you know, use the same tools and resell that to other dealerships. And it's grown significantly since then. We no longer just do used car dealer websites. Um, the websites are a huge part of what we do, but we also do the full range of digital marketing, um, you know, integration with uh, paid search, organic search, um, display advertising, social media. We cover a pretty wide spectrum at this point. Um, but when I go home and I talk to my grandparents, I tell them I build websites. So that's, <laughs> that's the easy answer. Um, over 650 people between Burlington and Manhattan Beach. So we host close to 15,000 sites on a single platform. The platform is um, JVM based. Uh, Java and Grails are the two JVM languages that we're using right now. We have been experimenting with Clojure and Scala. Uh, everything I'm talking about tonight is Java-based, though we also are using Mongo um, in our Grails application. We're using the, uh, the GORM Mongo uh, mapper. We use a combination of Spring, uh, Tomcat, Jetty, and some homegrown containers that kind of, the date back to when the company was founded, um, like 03-ish, they were going through some, some changes. If anyone remembers, you know, that was kind of around the time, 03, 04, maybe 05, um, Spring was just coming online. People were looking at how do I not use um, Java EE. And so Spring and Pico were both choices on the market. We chose Pico and built a whole computer <coughs> around it. We're now actually migrating away from that onto Spring, because Spring has everything we need. Um, so yeah, 15,000 sites for over 10,000 clients. Um, our peak um, load during the day is around 800 requests per second um, for the dynamic content. And I'll, on the next slide, I think, a few, a few slides. So these are some of the sites. Um, they are car dealer websites. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's not too much exciting to look at there, but you know we have. So we've got integration with a lot of things. Great to go back one, one two. Okay, so <coughs> yeah, right there. Um, on the left here, we've got some social media integration, right? So we've got configurations that control social media integration for each of the sites. We've got these slideshows, a typical slideshow is going to iterate through the slides to show whatever slides the dealer has uploaded. Uh, we've got inventory, you can see down below, just the top piece of the uh, featured inventory that you know, the dealer can choose which inventory is currently featured on the site. We've got search widgets, um, navigation. So there's a lot of configuration for each of these sites. Each site is totally configurable, both from a content perspective, like as in, um, you know, blogs, um, the content like what they put on the About Us page, um, configurable to the inventory level, the deals update their own inventory. So let's go forward here. So these are just a few examples of the sites. Um, next. And one more. Yes, okay. So high level. Um, we you know, we do use Akamai. So we are using Helen and Akamai services. We're actually <coughs> upgrading that to some of their newer stuff to get some security uh, services out of it as well. So your 800 requests are on your origin servers, not, not what? 800 Akamai requests is. on the dynamic origin servers, yeah. Okay. So we've got, um, yeah, so any requests for dynamic content come in to one origin, which is what we talk about when we talk about 800 requests per second. That's for the websites. That doesn't include the dealer tools that dealers like mm -hmm. and use. Um, we've got two other origins that host data content and um, static content like JavaScript, CSS, and then another set of origin servers that handles uh, images. And we're using for the some of that for the static stuff for the CSS and JavaScript. We are using Akamai's um, net storage, so 
So that doesn't actually hit our origin service at all. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do use Akamite. Um, it comes in pretty typical at this point. comes in through a firewall. We're running um, some F5 big IP load balancers in, in tandem. And then we go through a pooling process, right? So we've got 15,000 sites. We try to maintain some level of cache affinity. So we do pooling based on domain. <coughs> And we'll host two, maybe 3,000 um, sites per server. And we tend to run pools of two or three. And we also have a fallback pool where we have, um, you know, if everything goes to hell, we can actually service requests from a kind of generic pool that's just up there. We try not to use it, but if, you know, if both servers or if all three happen to go down for that one pool, we'll be fallback to that. Um, we're not a monolithic application. We are. Uh, I don't know if we're strictly SOA, but we are definitely using a lot of services, right? We try and break stuff out, we try and um, create services to you know, encapsulate each piece of the architecture. We've got services that handle the content and the configurations, and that's what this talk is primarily about. But we also have services that handle inventory, um, something called global vehicle, which is like catalog data. So not, you know, not the Ford Mustang on the dealer's lot, but Ford Mustangs in general, like catalog data that comes from the OEMs. Uh, account services, social services, so that's all services here. Um, and then in the back, we've got right now MySQL, MongoDB. We also use Elasticsearch and Solar for a few things. I've got this little blue box around here. We are using a distributed cache, which is what allows us to do um, a lot of the horizontal scaling that we've done. We're using um, Oracle Coherence. We've just upgraded to 3.7. That was a lot of fun. Um, so we, we make heavy use of coherence at this point. Um, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about in these coming slides is actually based on coherence. The config service DVS that we're talking about is a coherence, um, this configures a coherence cache service. Questions? Okay, next slide. All right, so here's the site. I mean, we had the site, the slide previously, but now there's an overlay on it. So the dealers edit the sites using a tool called Composer. And Composer is a WYSIWYG editor that allows you to edit content um, using um, JavaScript uh, widgets. We also allow you to set what we call preferences. Um, so every piece of your page can have content on it, but it can also have preferences. Um, in this case, we're looking at the preferences for a slideshow. That's the, the, the integral, like you know how frequently they uh, roll through the transition duration, the all the controls for the slideshow. And every widget on this page has its own set of preferences that handle how that actually, how it works, what it looks like, where it's pulling its inventory from, if it's new inventory, if it's used inventory. So that's what DBS is primarily concerned with, is um, storing and making quickly available these preferences and the rest of the configs that drive the websites. Um, I've got some numbers in an upcoming slide, but there's a lot of data that goes into each of these slides. In each of these sites. Um, they're all based on the same platform. We do run some different versions. Not everyone's on the same exact version of the platform. But the DBS system is the common underpinning of the whole thing. So, why did we write DBS? And so the, the, the project we're talking about, we started in April of 2010, and we launched it in August of 2010. If I recall, we were on so uh, on Mongo 1.4 when we went live, and I think Mongo was only about a year old at that point, so kind of qualifies as bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. So the um, the problem was to design and implement the next generation of Deal.com's um, website configuration management strategy. And I say next generation because I'll tell you a little bit about the previous generation, but the requirements were to support various file formats. Um, right now, they are all text files. Um, combination of Java property files, XML. I don't think we have any JSON in there, but we have, we have a number of different file types, and we want to be um, flexible with what we could support. We did not want to paint ourselves into a corner. Um, we want to be able to maintain revision history, both for our own sanity and to protect our clients. Um, it is not. Well, it doesn't happen all the time, but it's definitely happened more than once where there's been a disgruntled employee who has gone in basically torched the site and it left. And the dealer called up and says, my site is you know, totally destroyed, how do I get this back? So we need to have that ability to roll things back, to look at the history to see who did what, to have some accountability. 
So that was a core requirement from the get-go. Uh, we said in the beginning, we'd store six months of data or 10 revisions, whichever was um, higher or less. So minimum 10 revisions up to six months. We never actually implemented the cleanser. Greg can tell you why. Um, so right now we've got about two and a half years of data in the system. Um, we wanted to be able to scale to 10x growth. The company's been growing really fast. We have not grown 10x in two years, but we have we have grown. And so all the testing that we did, all the the architectural you know, the design, the decisions we made, and the testing we did were based around a 10x um, growth model. And we wanted to provide a client for internal users to be able to um, you know, download all the configs of the local system and work on them manually, in addition to the composer tool that the dealers use. Um, edit configurations, uh, view the logs, do whatever we need to do to quickly interact with the system. And we tend to prefer uh, command line tools. We're all Mac based, we've got you know, a good command line, so it's just nice to be able to have a client that can grab these files, pull them down. We do this kind of thing all the time. Um, you know, grab a box set, whatever, whatever we need to do to you know, modify a file, automatically push it back. So we wanted a good suite of command line tools to help us out. Um, so we had an existing solution, and I don't have a slide to talk about the existing solution, but the previous solution was using Subversion, so, which gets back to the comment I made previously. Mm -hmm. um, it's called SVNFS for Subversion File System. And what it was, it was the same model. We had um, a number of these services that ran within or within a coherence <coughs> cache service. So they would get a request, um, a read request, or they would get a write, and they would write to a local, um, you know, sandbox subversion repository using one of the, I forget the name of it, the um, one of the subversion Java libraries. <coughs> Sounds okay. Um, we had four of these boxes, and they each had three profiles, three instances of the JVM running. What we ended up with was a lot of contention. Um, three instances per box running to the same um, file system doing subversion um, commits all the time. Uh, it's it, it a fair amount of load on the system. And we were dealing with about 40 sites a week that were getting broken. And we had people, you know, customers would call and complain. And it wasn't like totally broken. Sometimes it would just be one page. Sometimes they made an edit. It wasn't showing up. Um, and we actually developed a suite of tools to go in and quickly blow away and stop all the, stop all the subversion um, clients on that one box, clean their repository, clean the SVN repo, and then bring everything back online. It was not a fun process uh, by any means. So, you know, we, we wanted to address that. So we had the you know, requirements that came out of the problems with that solution, which are scalability, robustness, and being able to maintain it. So maintainability. Next slide. Is, can I stop there? Yes. A question. Is there a reason you couldn't shard in some fashion? Shard. We could have. So what we did was we started looking at, sol at solutions to the problem. And what we ultimately came up with was, you know, I, I'm kind of believe, a big believer in the right tool for the right job. And I couldn't convince myself that the good people that wrote Subversion ever intended it to be used this way. Yeah. Um, so I kind of stopped the conversation at that point and said, let's find out something that actually does fit. Um, I can't remember the exact number of commits we had in the subversion repository, but if you took a thousand monkeys and put them in the room, writing a Shakespeare novel, they would never get to that number of commits. Um, and it just didn't seem to be the, the right solution to continue with. So we started looking around, and the first thing that came up was uh, JCR, I'm sorry, JSR 170, which is the Java Content Repository, which that itself was pretty new at the time. Again, this was like um, April of 2010. So we looked at using JSR 170, and I looked at a few implementations. Um, Jackrabbit, which is open source, JCRX, which was very expensive, and Mode Shape, which I don't recall which category that fell in. Um, I actually get to the point of having prototyped it and started loading data in and did some load testing on it. And we came, we came across a few problems. Um, the Jackrabbit and CRX were both um, Real, relational database fact. Um, and what we had was not relational data. We didn't care, we didn't, we didn't have any relational data that we wanted to save, we had documents. Mm -hmm. And what we were basically doing was stuffing um, XML into these big blobs and putting it inside of MySQL, which mm -hmm. didn't seem like the right way to go about it. 
and potentially huge data sets, especially when we get into the versioning aspect of things. Um, we were looking at how we are going to version it, was it going to be diff based or whatever, but we were still creating a lot of content that was going to be in MySQL, and it wasn't something we were comfortable with. When we looked at the size of it, taking that 10x, um, 10x growth expectation into account, it just it was not feasible. I did find, maybe it was Modeshape, um, one of the JSR 170 implementations that was actually based on Subversion. So I thought, hey, this could actually be cool. Maybe these people have done something with Subversion that we did wrong. Maybe, maybe I will give it another shot. Except the Subversion backend had no support for versioning, um, which blew my mind. Um, I think what they were doing was they were versioning the repository as a whole, but you could not get to versions of individual files within the repository. So that by itself was a non-starter right there. So this is an example of what our main site configuration looks like. This is just for future reference. Um, it's an XML file. It probably means nothing, just sitting there looking at it. But there's a lot of data in there. Um, because we've got several um, levels of nesting. We've got just a bunch of XML. This is very small. This is actually framed out. I'd say the average config file is probably maybe 5 to 10x the size, with some being maybe 100 times the size. The files can get pretty big. So after the failed foray into um, the JSR 170 stuff, oh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> we came across MongoDB. And MongoDB, again, was pretty new at this point. Um, a few of us have heard of it. You know, these technologies were coming out. They were being talked about. Uh, Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, um, Big Table, a lot of this stuff was coming out right around this time, so in the past six to nine months it was kind of getting some, uh, some headway. So yeah, I, my manager, boss, coworker, asked me to just go ahead and take a look at Mongo, and I did, and you know, the, the website right up at the top in big letters says, Scalable, High Performance, Open Source, Document Oriented Database. Well, that, that's what I need. Um, were any of the other choices appealing or, or not? We did look at the others, and I can't say that we gave everything a fair shake. Um, I don't know exactly why we chose Mongo, other than it was the first one, we, first one that we looked at. We decided to give it a shot, and it just fit the requirements to a team. Love at first sight. Huh? Love at first sight. Yeah, to a degree. And actually, still pretty much love after a while. Um, you know, we, we did look at some others briefly, you know, reading a couple of white papers, whatnot, but. You know, Mongo builds itself as a document-oriented um, storage system, and we had documents. Um, so some of the other NoSQL systems are you know, key-value stores or um, column uh, stores. So they, they, they didn't fit quite what we were looking for. Mongo, um, Mongo did. So we came up with a plan. Um, we were now down to three months to get this whole system live, based on the original plan. Um, and Mongo DB 1.4 was what we had. 1.5 was an alpha at that point. I think they follow, they follow the alternate um, versioning scheme. So 1.6 would have been the one that we went with. Um, so we said Mongo 1.4 is what we're going to have when we go live. So anything we need has to be supported by that um, by the feature set present in 1.4. We want to keep the remainder of the application in place. So I mentioned the caching layer. We didn't want to change that. We were not going to go to any kind of REST <coughs> based service. We were going to do a different kind of caching. We were going to stick with coherence. We went with what at the time was the preferred way to um, load balance and uh, scale Mongo, which was a master-slave deployment. Uh, with, and then we had replicated slaves in our local environment. We've got a data center here in El Segundo, and we're in El Segundo right now, right? Yeah. That's okay. So we've got a data center here. We've got local, all the local environments are housed in Vermont, so we've got replication between the two. Um, so we can actually have comps of the live data um, for development. And we said, you know, when Mongo 1.6 comes out, we'll look at switching to the sharded um, architecture that that you know, brings along. And we also said we'd only support a subset of our configuration support for the first release. We want to do a rolling release. We want to be able to be pretty safe about this, do it over a few weeks, and not get to a point where we could not go back. If, you know, this is based on the underpinnings of, at the time, 10, 12,000 sites. We could not screw that up. So we want to be very cautious in how we move forward. <coughs> so. This is what we came up with. Um, we came up with a MongoDB master and slave. Um, it was a basically a hot cold, right? So all the rights went, all the rights and all the reads went to the master. In the case where we had a failover, we, the reason um, Harpy, 
on the Linux boxes to switch to FPS. Um, we would switch to the slave. That actually never happened. Just so then we have DBS, the Dialog Conversion System. We've got four nodes, each running three, three JVMs, um, attached to a distributed cache, and then the CMS was also attached to the distributed cache. All read and write requests went through the cache. Um, it's a write behind system, so you write it to the cache, return immediately, and the cache will write it through DBS when it feels like it. We also came up with um, a REST API, um, which I think was one of, actually one of the great decisions we made about this. We use this every day of the week. Um, we need to see what's around the client site. We don't need to have any special tooling, no matter where you are, whose computer you're on, if you're visiting someone in support. We bring up a web browser, we type in the, one of the live cache server names, and we can immediately see um, all the configs. We can see all the history for all the configs. It's a really powerful way that we found to um, make management and maintainability you know, easy for this. And then the command line client that I mentioned before that we want to write, we, we wrote in Ruby. Um, it's a Gitish interface, so we have you know pull commands, we have push commands, um, similar to Git, because we're all in Git at the time. All right, so this is the actual work being done. Um, we want to get out of the office. The office is pretty great, but we want to get out and kind of focus. So we're in Greg's apartment. Uh, he was nice enough to let us hang out there for four days. Uh, we had a three-person development team plus a manager who doesn't get included in the development team. Um, we came up with a simplified version control scheme. We looked at doing diffs. We looked at you know, how, do, how do you generate a version control scheme that doesn't you know, bloat, right? We didn't want to store copies of every single um, revision that was made. But then we decided, you know what, Mongo can handle this. We're talking about a lot of data, but Mongo prides itself on being able to handle a lot of data, being very fast. So we actually created full copies on each commit. Um, so you make a commit, full copy. One of the nice things about it is it's very easy to go into Mongo and within the Mongo shell, look at a document and actually be able to see the entire thing. We don't need to do any you know, gym mental gymnastics of trying to assemble the whole thing. Um, and we get into like, you know, difficult to solve maintenance problems. And we decided at the time we would implement a cleanser to reinforce the retention policy. As I mentioned, I didn't need that. Um, luckily, Mongo has been kind of forgiving of us in that regard. So we use the MongoDB Java driver. Uh, MongoDB provides first-class support for a large number of drivers. They develop them in-house. Tengen, the company behind Mongo, um, it has people working on these drivers. They accept open source contributions as well, but um, they've actually got people supporting you know, drivers for just about every language imaginable. I know all, I believe every single one of the JVM languages has support um, either natively or through uh, the Java driver. We looked at multiple ODM layers. So ODM is object document mapping, as opposed to the more familiar ORM for relational databases. Um, we had decided to build our own. I don't know if that's the proudest moment um, I have, but the uh, ODMs that we had, you know, Mongo was new. Mongo was kind of bleeding edge. The ODM selection was <coughs> bloody, right? There was not a lot of, well, there wasn't any maturity in what we could find at the time. So we decided to build our own ODM uh, based on driving annotations and reflection, and we kind of took a black box approach to it. We built it, we covered it with a massive number of unit tests, and it's been largely forgotten since then. Um, it's actually worked really well. There are some pain points that I'll get into in a couple minutes, but if there's one piece of this whole thing that I would say avoid at all costs, it is building your own ODM. And we're going to talk at the end of the talk about uh, Spring Data which is probably what I would consider the way to go now. But there are other um, <coughs> options as well. Uh, at Dealer, we are not proud to say that we have five different ODMs for dealing with Mongo right now. And we're trying to standardize and you know, bring everything back in. But we had a few teams that saw how successful we were in that first release, and they actually went and built their own solutions. Um, and they built their own ODMs for it because they didn't like ours. So <coughs> not the case anymore. Right now, there's plenty of tooling, plenty of support for this. So. Um, you no need to go in and build your own Java annotation based uh, document mapper. And as I said, we built a RESTful admin client uh, based on Ruby with Gitish commands. And we used our RESTlet as the um, integration point on the Mongo backend, which, again, te technology we've moved away from now, but it still lives on in this project. Okay. Questions? I had one, one question just in a little tangent, but mm -hmm. 
did you consider open sourcing any of those OVM implementations in order to get like community <coughs> and the behind them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, between the time that we <coughs> made the decision to go with our own and the time that we went, it was done and we went live in August, it was already apparent at that point that there's, you know, there's already enough stuff happening in the community that we could have taken something off the shelf. Um, but why did, why did you end up with four follow-on implementations then? The follow-on implementations are, you, uh, I'm sorry, so they're not custom-made at dealer. The follow-on implementations are people choosing other options. Um, so we did the whole thing from scratch. The next one to follow on after us was using the Jackson um, JSON mapper. So Mongo is using, I did ask, ask this in the beginning, who's using Mongo? Anyone? Okay. Um, so Mongo on the server is actually using a binary JSON format, which they call BSON. Um, they've got all of their, all the classes in the driver basically support taking a JSON object and you can easily convert it to BSON. So the second follow on ODM just use Jackson to um, print to map all the objects into JSON and then just use the, the Mongo driver to get that JSON into the BSON format that was expected. The follow-on driver after that used the GORM, the Grails uh, GORM um, ODM. I think there's another one. And then the final one is Spring Data, which we've been using much, you know, on most projects since then. So by the time we went live in August, um, the Jackson thing was already in place. People were already, already learning Gore. We realized there were going to be, within a matter of months, a plenty of um, choices in the ODM space. So we did not want to inflict our pain on any other people. So when it came to deployment time, um, like I said, we did not want to take down an existing infrastructure. So we planned on a phased deployment. The initial release was just to get all the code up in the live environment. <clears throat> you know, deploy MongoDB itself in the data center, get everything set up. Um, we are running MongoDB, or were at the time, on hardware. Most of what we do is virtualized, but that was on hardware systems. Um, we did the initial import of all the data from the previous subversion solution, um, and then we tested. We did a lot of testing. For about the whole week, we were just in the live environment. We did load testing, we did failover testing. Um, we get to week two, and we did functional release one. So at this point, we did an incremental data import to catch ourselves up, and then we took the primary site configs. So the site configuration is the basis for making all the websites work. Um, that's the only configuration we moved over. So the SVNFS system was still live for the other configs, but we went live for the primary um, site configs in DBS. And we did it at one of our 3 a.m. maintenance windows, and it failed horribly. I don't remember the exact reason, but it was 6 a.m. and we said, okay, we gotta roll back. <clears throat> so we rolled back, went to bed, went to work, went to bed. Um, and tried it two nights later, we found out what the problem was, went back out, we did it, it actually worked the second time. And it's something fairly minor that had broken. I wish I could remember what it was now. So we let it soak in for a week and we didn't have any issues. And one of the things we talked about up front was how do we roll this back and when is the no go back time? And we decided that we'd be willing to go back and backport all the data that we had into the old SVN system after about a week or so. And once we get to that point, we said it wasn't going to be worth it. We would suffer the pain and just make it work at that point. So functional release two was week three. We migrated the remaining configs. I think there were seven more at that time, maybe eight. Um, and then we held our breath for a while. Is that like saying seven more document types? Seven more document types, yeah. Um, yeah, stuff like you know, navigations, the control of navigation on the site, the slideshows, you know, any number of others. So we waited and we watched. Um, about a month later, we had a big company meeting and the head of our product support group got up and said they had gone from 40 calls per week um, with site speed just totally busted to zero. Wow. And it had stayed at zero basically for the month from the day we released this product. Wow. So we basically just gave ourselves a pat on the back and <laughs> Point. It laid some people up. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely, they found more work to be done. So, um, and then we decommissioned the OS and MS servers. And we, we had a big talk about flying the boxes back from the LSA Data Center and doing an office space thing in the field with a hatchet on those boxes. They had caused countless hours of pain, and we wanted to destroy them. But instead, we just 
let each person who had been affected by the pain, you know, get the halt command on them, and that was the end of it. Um, <laughs> and that was that was the end of the format thing that we got. We still don't want to respect the guy that wrote it, we just don't like the system. Right? <laughs> and then we rejoiced. And things were really good. Um, we basically just kind of forgot about it, moved on, and just let the system hum along. Hmm. So two years later, um, where are we at? We've added six new uh, configuration types, data types, um, since the launch of the system. And last summer we added site content, which was a huge step for us. Mm -hmm. That was the first step from having um, site configurations, which aren't all that sexy, but kind of they drive the site we need them, <coughs> um, to actually putting site content in there, which is the user editable content. That was pretty huge for us. Um, that was pr probably the biggest <laughs> Migration headache, just because of the way the site content is associated with each widget on the site, there's a lot of work that went into that. Um, migration to our replica set. So we stayed for a year and a half on the master slave configuration. When I gave this talk at Longo Boston um, last year, I submitted the slide deck, and I got a, you know, they, they reviewed the slides and gave me suggestions. And I got a a call or an email from one of the technical people who said, you cannot have Master Slave in the slide deck when you present this, because we do not want anyone else doing that. That's like the old one got four way of doing it. When I was at Longer Boston last year, it was 1.8 was out, I think 2.0 was on the horizon and it just released. Um, so we eventually got on, you know, got on the train and migrated to a replica set. So Mongo's replica set support is pretty great. Um, you have a number of Mongo boxes, which are all equals within the replica set. Um, the driver is what chooses which box you're talking to. You can have, you can configure it in a few different ways. You know, you can have one um, master, which you know all writes and reads go to. You can have all the writes go to one. You can have the reads span across the other boxes. It depends on what you're going for. If you're going for you know, scalability versus just um, time availability. But the driver handles all that for you. you specify the names of all the servers, the Mongo servers and the driver, it chooses when one goes down, they have an election, they choose a new master, the driver recognizes that and fails over most of the time. Um, you know, most of the effort in that migration was actually in testing. Creating a replica set in Mongo is one, two, handful of commands um, on the command line. It's very easy to set up. Um, but testing was a big thing, so we set up a load testing harness for that. We tested it, just Mongo itself, we tested it through the cache. Um, another migration was pretty much a piece of cake. We did it at 3 a.m. It took maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes, half an hour for the systems engineers to get everything set up. And then we just started taking boxes down um, for live load. We did some live load testing and then some live failure testing. Took a box out, verified that the drivers on all the, on all the uh, DBS nodes would just switch over. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty easy. Um, Driver versions, we stayed nine months on the initial driver version that we had, and then we finally upgraded. Um, we ran into an authorization issue, which actually was, we didn't know at the time, it was um, caused by some pretty bad indexes that we had. It was causing timeouts on the um, timeouts within Mongo because of the, the queries were taking too long, so the driver was timing out. But it, um, it made itself uh, present to us in the form of an authorization issue because the authorization would then time out. So we upgraded the driver and fixed that. And as soon as we did that, that's when we actually realized we had bad indexes. Um, I interrupt for just a second. Yeah. I've got to run. We yeah. Up. Sorry. Got to sit down. <laughs> um, keeping up with MongoDB versions, like I said, we ran for a year on 1.4. The next upgrade we did was uh, 1.8 in August of 2011. And today we're on 2.04, 204. All right, so what do these queries look like? Um, you saw the, you got questions? We're going too fast, slow me down. Um, you saw the, what one of the site configs looks like. And basically that site config, you know, with, with the XML, the nested uh, elements with an XML, turns us pretty easily into a, a nested JSON document. Um, so these are just a few examples of the queries that we run. Um, all queries for any of these configuration types, any of the 18 configuration types we have, have some common um, pieces. For every single one of them, you specify a site ID. Each site is like its own, you know, I think I'm looking for. 
but its own uh, piece of configuration. It has all of its own config files. Um, that we don't share them between sites usually. There are a few cases where we do. And then we have a tagging system. So we have versions. Every time you um, do a commit, it creates a brand new copy and it tags it with a tag that says tag live and tag head. And right now they're the same. The whole point is at some point we'll be able to have draft support where head can go ahead of live and then you can publish it and then it'll become the live copy. Um, in some cases we have um, <coughs> languages. So for the label files we have, um, you know, we support different locales. So that becomes part of the key that we're looking up on. These are all indexed. And so each collection in Mongo, collection in Mongo is equivalent to a table mm -hmm. um, in a relational database. Each collection, I'd say, has between two and five indexes on it, um, depending on what kind of content it has. But the indexes always include the site ID and the tag. Um, those are the two things that we always make sure we specify, even when we're doing queries um, ourselves to get in the system and find, you know, find some kind of problem. Um, site ID and the tag are the things we query on. With the exception, when we get into looking at all revisions of a site, we leave the tag off and we can get all revisions to come back. Um, those queries do take a little bit longer. Uh, we do have, like I said, revision numbers on every single um, document within Mongo. So we can easily go in and say, give me a site ID with this revision number. That's supported through the REST client as well. So it's really easy to get back to history um, to take a look at all the revisions you have, call it the one you want, get back to it. One of, the problem, one of the challenges that we have is the way the mapping is done, we find ourselves using a piece of the query syntax called the WHERE clause. Um, so what the WHERE clause does is you usually narrow it down with like something like site ID and tag. And then WHERE is actually a piece of JavaScript that gets executed for every um, document that comes back from the rest of the query. As you can imagine, it's very slow. It's not something we do at all in production. We tend to do it locally when we're looking up something very specific that's nested so far down that we can't get to it with a typical model query. Um, we could also use MapReduce, but we found that for the, for the type of queries we were making, the MapReduce wasn't giving us that much of a benefit over um, the where, where query syntax. So current stats, 18 collections or config types. Um, the largest collection is the site configs, which have like right, one million. Oh, no, that's 10 million. sorry. That's uh, that's our entire database has that many. That's the whole thing. Okay, so that's the entire um, <coughs> the what we call the CMS um, MongoDB has ten million documents, ten point five million documents, three hundred gigabytes. Um, most sites have well under a thousand revisions, but you do get some people that are just really excited about updating their site constantly, and we've seen mm -hmm. some that. Last year, there were upwards of eight, nine thousand. Um, today, I'm sure they're well up, you know, twelve, fifteen thousand revisions, um, which makes us think people are actually automating some of our tools, which does not make us happy. But for the time being, the Mongo is still handling it, so we're in a whole other out there. Um, the content collection is getting much bigger. It's up to um, six hundred ninety-one thousand uh, documents now. Uh, Two point two gigs and Actually, that's an old stat, but we had 20% growth in the first two months, so that's actually it's probably like 25 times that right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I said to talk about some pain points. Um, nested maps. So in Mongo, it's really easy to query, so it's a JSON document, right? It's very easy to query through um, if you have a list. So if I have um, an element in Mongo, which has as which has a list of other elements. It's very easy to query through that list. It'll, Mongo will go into each element within the list and you know, extend the query all the way through using the Mongo dot notation. However, I, when I implemented this, I implemented the maps as actual maps, which translate into sub-elements you know, within the JSON. You cannot query through all of those. Mongo doesn't understand the difference. Well, there is no difference between um, different sub-elements and sub-elements that are actually all the same type. So that's why we end up using this where syntax, and it's incredibly painful. And if there's one thing I would do different, that is probably it, other than not writing my own idea. Um, you know, a much better implementation would have been a list with the key of the of that item you know, being one of the fields within the object that happens to live in the list. We would, we would save a lot of time if we had gone um, in that direction. Not so much an issue 
today, I mean, if you're going to use any of the existing ODMs, my assumption, the experience is that they're actually doing this much better than we did it um, then. It does support paging. You can just return 10 documents, 100 documents, whatever. Um, and lack of a visualization or a monitoring tool. This is not as much of an issue anymore. We still have not, you know, we haven't selected a monitoring tool or visualization tool. We've basically built up experience and a number of homegrown tools to help us monitor the system. But there are a number of um, tools available today for Mongo to you know, actually have a, a console, some way to look at the health of the system. All right, what do we got? Future. Um, so sharding, we have not sharded the system yet. Mongo has excellent you know, built-in support for sharding, creating a sharded system. Um, it's not something we've had to do. What sharding tends to look like is you create a replica set per shard. So you've actually got a highly available, um, each shard becomes a highly available replica set. Um, and the, again, the driver is where all the configuration is done. With a sharding environment, you do use um, a Mongo S instance, which is able to, like, Mongo S basically keeps track of the sharding, which shards live on which replica sets. Um, so the driver talks to the Mongo S instance. You can have multiple Mongo S's, which the drivers will talk to, so you still you know, avoid single point of failure. You have a um, highly available system in <coughs> that. Um, we are looking at moving blog, our blog support into Mongo, and at that point I'm pretty sure we're going to need to start sharding the system. It's going to grow pretty significantly at that point. Um, application improvements, I mentioned we want to move on to draft support so someone can make edits to their site, eventually go into the publish button, and um, have it become live then, as opposed to having it go live as soon as they hit the save. Um, Serializing on one ODM would be awesome. The thought of, you know, uh, doing a schema migration with the amount of data we have now is not something I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're actually going to get there. And then removing the dependency on the distributed cache is a huge fantasy of mine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Mongo's fast, so one of the things we've been talking about is just taking the cache out using um, RESTful service calls from within the content management system, go directly to the service, and you know, we're growing the cache all together. Mm -hmm. All right, so Greg's going to talk now um, about the content manager. All right. So I'm Greg. Um, last year, I got to uh, help design and implement a new, new uh, collection for Mongo for our DBS system. Um, we needed to create basically a content management system it was going to replace our existing blog system. It was going to be used on J Power's website to replace um, or to support all the different types of content that they show on their website. So it needed to also have revision history and another added piece was the free text searching and fastening. Um, when you're on their page, you can see listings of their content and you want to be able to search through that. Um, so one of the requirements was really to have a dynamic object model and this is something that Mongo really supports well because it's essentially schemaless or dynamic schema. Um, it needed to be able to support multiple types of contents with varying attributes. So you know, blog posts have like title, content, tags, stuff like that. Like a video article could have a video associated with it. Um, some of the automotive articles would have year, make, model, you know, vehicle attributes associated with it. So we needed to be able to serve all that as a you know, one, one object model. Um, so we used our existing DBS system, but we had to modify it a little bit. Our DBS system only does or at the time only returned one document at a time and so it didn't support things like paging or uh, getting distinct um, set of attributes. Um, so well, let me go back to the dynamic object model. So for what I did with the dynamic object model, um, I have a base class it basically has all the common um, attributes that all content shares, like title, tags, categories, URL. Um, but then I had a generic map of just attributes. 
and the attributes were um, polymorphic classes um, with different data types, and each of the data types could have nested relationships with each other. Um, so you can make like blog posts as a content type, and a blog post could have images, which could be a list, and an image could be also a content type. So there's all sorts of relationships, and it's all completely dynamic and not hard coded in the Java. So I created um, an XML schema to define the metadata, the relationship with the data types um, between um, the different content types. So the idea was eventually we could have um, different sites using this and they could go in and they could create their own content types. Um, if you ever use like Expression Engine, um, that kind of has this idea where you could go in, you could create a content type and then you could uh, create different um, attributes that you want for that content type. And that's sort of what I loosely based it on. Also, uh, schema.org. Um, but anyway, um, so this XML defined these content types, and the UI that would render this would use that XML to know what content types or what attributes to display what text boxes for different fields and uh, so Mongo handled this really well because it doesn't care what the schema is. Um, one of the things we had to change with our ODM was the ability to support polymorphic classes. So to get around that what I did was storing the class with the collection or with the document itself. Um, so when it Reserializes it out of JSON and knows what class, what version of class to create. Um, Spring Data do, does that as well. Um, and the other thing, so to make this perform better on the actual websites, we indexed it in Elasticsearch, and that Elasticsearch supports free text searching, supports faceting. It was just, it made a lot more sense than querying Mongo directly and trying to create this functionality. Um, although Mongo does, you know, have regex support for free text searching, and, uh, but Elasticsearch made more sense. And yeah, so our, um, our UI, where you can go in and edit this content, actually queries Mongo directly, and for stuff like that we want to aggregate um, in the UI they can filter by categories or tags of the content, so I use Mongo Distinct to return those. But generally I feel that Mongo does not, um, at least the version we were using did not have great aggregation support for getting data like that. Newer versions have aggregate methods. Um, but at the time, it did not. So, yeah. Uh, do you have questions? Um, and how do, at a high level, how does editing flow and liveness work within your system for things, you know, like a lot, you're using Elasticsearch to index some of the changes. You know, how soon does it, from, so say so someone's using the editing tools to edit those configuration right. files. Do they have? A, is there a special pathway they take to access the data, the site itself, so they can immediately see their changes, or are their changes just going to be live for everyone? Or how does that work? Um, the changes are immediately live. You mean for the DDS system in general, or just this piece of um, this piece of the DDS the system in general? Yeah. What's the in terms of like liveness? So, how does it all work out? So they they log into a separate app that does writes for the DBS system and they, when they make changes, it gets pushed to our um, distributed cache system. So it'll get written to the cache and the cache will propagate that change out to all the other caches. And then it's almost immediate. They can then hit the site itself and they'll see the change almost immediately because of the distributed cache. Um, but yeah, and then once it's written to the cache, the cache will then connect to the DBS client and write it to Mongo. Is that? Yeah, and then in terms of the Elasticsearch. So the, this was a bit more complicated um, how we had to architect it. We 
same same way, it still gets written through the DVS system through the cache, but then um, we had a Rabbit connection, um, Rabbit MQ. So when the cache picked up a write from the DVS specifically for the content management system, it would put the message on a Rabbit queue, and that would. I guess we should go into. So. So the website is is not hosted in our um, main data center. It's actually hosted in our we have a cloud um, EC2 Amazon cloud um, servers. So we had to um, we had to set up those servers in the cloud because we had like an uptime agreement where we couldn't be down and if we connected it to our main cluster, it was going to be too unstable. If, you know, for whatever reason, we bring down all the sites. So we. Migrated a lot of our code so that it would run in EC2, um, but then we had the problem where we had to keep the data in sync, right? So that's where we used RabbitMQ. Right. So um, the content management system is not applied to all our sites right now. It's just using it's just being used in the cloud. Um, so what would happen is the write um, would get put onto a RabbitMQ from the DBS uh, client after it's been written in Mongo. And then there's an application in the cloud that would pull that down. And um, Elasticsearch actually supports um, connections to it'll consume Rabbit um, without any without any coding. So you can so there there are two queues. There was the Rabbit MQ for Elasticsearch, and there's one for um, Mongo. So our JD Power site in the cloud also needed the Mongo instance to get all its data from. So any writes to the JD Power site would go on that um, queue for just Mongo updates. That would go up to an application that would pull off the writes and then write them to Mongo. Um, and then, so that was relatively fast. It was almost instantaneous. Um, so if they made edits to JD Power, they'd see it almost immediately on your website. It would get propagated up to the cloud. And then the second queue was just for indexes for Elasticsearch and so on. So that would update the Elastic index, which um, for their site, they'd only see the Elastic um, stuff when they went to listings pages and search pages for the content. When the actual articles loaded, we just did the primary key lookup for Mongo, because that's, that was really fast and we indexed on, on that. So yeah, we used Rabbit to Keep everything in sync. Other questions? Um, so you can do this. So the other thing we started using, as Kevin said, was Spring Data. Uh, it's been awesome, actually. Uh, it supports basically it'll just do any code out of the box. Um, simple code. I mean, if you have like a complex structure. There's annotations and custom converters you can write to uh, do the mapping for you. But for the most part, it, um, for the two projects I've been using it on, it just works. Um, and they also have interfaces that you can, out of the box, support paging if you're, um, you know, if you need paging support on your domain class, you need to return multiple um, CRUD support. And it'll basically implement this for you. You just have to write the interface. And uh, Spring does all that behind the scenes. You can also you know, modify and create your own custom repositories. But it's, it's really simple to set up uh, Spring data. And yeah, so that's what, going forward, aside from DBS, that's, that's our uh, preferred ODM. Um, Sean doesn't seem to be specific to the auto dealer industry. I mean, it seems fairly generic and able to go into any kind of domain. Has there been any talk about tapping other vertical industries as expansion? Um, <clears throat> yes, talk, yes. Um, ultimately, as a company, our, um, our experience is in auto, and the system is definitely Accessible. I can take the system to the fine example. Uh, we did a 
kind of like a pro bono um, website for um, a group called Golden Hubs, which is a golden retriever rescue in, I think, in Burlington, Vermont. Mm -hmm. So, we don't take joke, we sell dogs on our sites as well. <laughs> um, but it's a rescue site, so we don't feel bad about it. So, yeah, we can, anything that, our sites are based on two big things content, like we talk about in DBS, and inventory. And in the case of the Golden Hunt site, they had content, blog posts, whatnot. They also had inventory, which happened to be dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we've looked at actually, um, you know, how we can apply this to other industries. We've done some you know, interesting proof of concepts on that. But ultimately, <coughs> as a company, our experience and our, <coughs> you know, we're really good at the auto industry, right? Mm -hmm. And so, regardless of what we can do, is on the software side of things, all of our you know, account managers, mm -hmm. the whole company is very geared towards auto right now. Mm -hmm. So while it's been talked about, we've never, we haven't seriously, you know, taken the system and said, well, let's actually apply it and, and you know, try that out. Um, we definitely. Can I say that? Fine. Yeah, we, did say that. Yeah. we did. Yeah, we've done. Experience. We had a we had a relationship with one company in Canada, um, and we were doing real estate sites, mm -hmm. uh, very similar thing. Mm -hmm. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> and I, I think one of the reasons we did we don't do that anymore is what I just said is that our you know our bread and butter is the auto, auto mm -hmm. industry. So it's this is definitely accessible. Um, for right now, it's so much opportunity in the auto industry mm -hmm. that it's just better for us to focus. Sure. How many, sure. How many dealers are there in the United States? You have 10,000 10, now. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know the exact number of how many dealers there are. Um, mm -hmm. We probably have closer to 12K now. We, we're number one in the space, but there are some you know, competitors close by. Um, so we feel that we have a lot of room to grow still in terms of getting new dealers. Um, but there's also a huge opportunity to grow and just you know um, expand the solution that we have. You know we're looking at display advertising, we're looking at social media, we're looking at mobile. You know refining our mobile experience. We do both mobile and desktop sites. Mm -hmm. um, so when it, when we look at opportunities for growth, and we look at stepping outside of you know what we know really well, or staying inside of that and uh, you know addressing different concerns within mm -hmm. that vertical, uh, whether it be display advertising, whether it be social. Right now that's where we're stepping. Um, another question. Uh, as I understand, Mongo is written in C, right? It's, as I say, yes. Yeah. Is there any concerns about not having like a hotspot compiler to be able to optimize things according to the hardware it's being run on? Or? It hasn't been um, a concern to us up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the any issues that we have, you know, our potential issues that we have in our environment, um, Mongo mm -hmm. is the least of our concerns. Mm -hmm. The only time Mongo has actually been something that we've had to worry about was when we had insufficient indexes on some of the collections. Mm -hmm. um, and after two or three painful evenings, um, we realized that it was just the fact that we had outgrown the indexes that we had. Um, we kind of all, you know, we, all, uh, we didn't know. We gave for the jury looks and then moved on. And um, yeah, we've been fine since then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mongo itself has been nothing short of awesome for us as a technology choice. Mm -hmm. We made yeah, I mentioned that we kind of started off with this homegrown solution, a homegrown um, container, uh, application container based on PICO. And coherence was the only big piece of infrastructure that we used that we had built in house. And today, that's not the case at all. Um, you know, Greg mentioned RabbitMQ. We're heavily using RabbitMQ. Um, we are heavily using Mongo, Sol, or Elasticsearch. We're still on coherence, but we're also using uh, EHCache. Uh, we're using InfiniSpan in one case uh, for caching. So we're looking at a lot of different um, technologies and using them pretty successfully at this point. Um, it's always, you know, when someone brings a new technology, it's not a case of, oh, this is cool, let's use it. It's a case of, you know, will it solve a problem, mm -hmm. but also is it something we're comfortable going live with, right? Can we go live with this technology? Is it going to support, you know, the whole platform that's based on it and not cause, you know, problems, right? Can it, can it scale? Can it be highly available? Do we know how to operate it? Those are the those are the big um, you know decision points that we apply to technology choice. And Mongo you know, has done very well in kind of you know, meeting all those expectations. The question is like, well, you store everything in XML. Why don't you store everything in JSON? Like, like I said, um, like I said. we tried to um, to minimize the amount of work we had to do, right? We had three months and only 
two or three developers on it. So it was a, a question of how much could we be done in a short amount of time. So we stuck with the existing caching solution, even though with Mago, it's documented at a time. So you'll, you'll always get the API document. Okay. But the, the configurations, of, like I said, we have 18 data types, 18 configuration types. So it, it's broken up pretty well. While a site config can get pretty huge, um, the other configs, like for navigation, for third party service integration, uh, label files, custom JavaScript, custom CSS, um, they tend to be reasonably sized. Um, We've done the work up front to break those out of the main site config uh, rather than you know then breaking site config further within within Mongo. So each edit creates a new document, right? Each edit creates a new document, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is why when you know we we have some people that just spend a lot of time going in and for SEO purposes creating a huge number of pages on their site. You know, we've got some clients that will go in and for each model of vehicle they have, like the, the 2012 Acura. Um, TL, right? They'll create a new page, a landing page for the 2012 Acura TL in each of the towns or the cities around them. So they have these huge number of pages, um, the search engine value. Um, and so, yeah, that ends up creating a lot of updates into the system. But so far, Mongo's been okay handling that. We do plan to implement the cluster. We, the reason we didn't do it was we just didn't get to it. Other projects came out, Mongo was still motoring a lot. Well, so, um, we did get to the cluster. So the well, cleanser, I, the whole story, I, yeah. I, can, I worked on the cleanser and it wasn't ready, it was kind of ready when we did the initial release and um, what it used was MapReduce um, to basically it would search for all the, um, all the revisions, sort it by date and just grab, um, if there's more than 10, you know, grab all the ones that are more than 10 and then run deletes on all of those. Mm -hmm. um, but we found that running the MapReduce um, caused all the writes and reads to block and we were getting uh, nulls cached. So like I said, to go down um, while this was running. Um, MapReduce, unless, unless you're sharding, I think it only runs on a single thread. So it's different than I think 2.0 if it changed that. So you can run MapReduce currently now with other queries in the uh, Ryzen system, but mm -hmm. at the time of 1.4 it was, wow. it, it would block. Block the yeah. office, yeah. So yeah, and it took like 15 minutes to run even at, with the small data set we started with, and um, we just couldn't let it, you know, couldn't let it block reads even at 3 in the morning. So um, I made a second attempt at trying to write it a few months later, and just found that MapReduce just, it, I think we were still using, I think it was like 1.8 at the time. Mm -hmm. I was still doing the same problem with MapReduce. I tried to optimize it a little bit. And, um, well, with this so cheap, do you really care? Right, that's the point. Yes, <laughs> we don't. And Mongo's been, you know, Mongo, the correct index is on the collection, it's, it doesn't seem to care at all. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of reasons we would like to get the cleanser in place. I mean, there's, you know, stuff to worry about with large data sets beyond just, you know, doing the queries. I mean, like I said, disks, we, we start to outgrow a system, you know, we do need to migrate over, put additional disks in, at a minimum take down the VM, you know, add more storage, bring it back up again. It's a process, um, even if it's not that difficult. But, you know, backups, backups become much larger, they become, they take that much longer to transfer back and forth. So there's a lot of operational reasons that we want to get the cleanser in place. Um, but the operational reasons haven't been critical enough for us to take the time to do it yet. Mm -hmm. A question. Uh, at some point of time, you said you want to replace this uh, distributed cache with uh, MongoDB. Mm. Um, so how much time, how much savings are you counting on? Like? Well, so the, it's kind of like fantasy to get away from distributed cache. Um, <laughs> we have had, I'm not sure the exact number today. Um, within the past four months or so, we had up to 212 nodes on the distributed cache. Um, coherence is pretty good. Best of free, I mean, it's expensive, right? Mm -hmm. But um, 212 nodes on the cache was still a major pain point for us because as good as coherence is, you can still find ways to take it down. And the irony of that is that the system that allows you to be you know, horizontally scalable and highly available, in and of itself becomes a single point of failure. 
Mm -hmm. And we were seeing that. We haven't seen it as much lately. Um, but what we're, what we're trying to do is take things off the cache that don't need to be there. So we're not talking about replacing the cache with Mongo, but in this case we're saying we might not need the cache because Mongo might be good enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're also doing things like looking at whether or not we need immediate consistency. And there's a question before about how how we maintain that consistency. And every everywhere that uses the cache is immediately consistent. You do it right, it's a right behind, so it might not be in the database immediately, uh, whether it's MySQL or Mongo, but it is immediately available for every other consumer of that cache to get the latest copy. We have you know, no dirty reads, we have immediate consistency. Um, we don't need that for everything. You know, it might be okay for some stuff on sites to be out of date by a second, 10 seconds, a few minutes, maybe an hour, right? So we're trying to look, um, you know, moving the, to the distributed cache kind of felt like, oh, this is the solution for everything. And now we look at the distributed cache and say, well, yeah, it's great, it's very powerful, but we don't need to use it everywhere. There's more, there's simpler solutions that incur less operational overhead, you know, less just crazy debugging time. Um, so we're looking at ways to, you know, to leverage some of those. I have a question on uh, Greg's stuff. Yeah. How did you have a question? Because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked on that system. So um, you said you, you, when you write to the composer for the JDPA, it sends a message to the cloud and Elasticsearch mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, did you, uh, do you guys have some sort of transactional context there? Or how do you keep those in sync? Um, there is no transactional context. No. The, Assumption is if it makes it to Elastic, it made it to Mongo as well. Okay. Um, we have not had that fail yet. Okay. Um, it's not by any means a business critical aspect of the system. Um, I think there have been situations where. Have there? Well, okay, uh, this morning actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, Elastic will stop consuming messages, but uh -huh. the Mongo. Uh, oh, still. The Mongo application that's running Mongo still consumes, and so there'd be slight out of date between the listings page and the actual um, okay. view of the article. Which is better than the alternative. We'd rather have the source of the record be up to date. This morning, really? Uh, Emily this morning. Cool. Thank you. No? Did you have a 